So anyway, that's just to give you an idea of what I found. 1,600 pages of this. And I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with this? So I, I actually, I, I saw, I talked with one other specialist in Spain that I had seen in some simple <coughs> and I like the way she worked because she was very precise and we needed a lot of precision here and I'm not that precise I have to learn it the, the mm -hmm. most difficult way but anyway uh, she agreed to do it and then we embarked on this adventure that lasted it, it has lasted so far six years and has given us some moments that were very moving because we were discovering some interesting things and moments that were really despairing like oh my gosh why did we decide to do this are we masochists what's wrong with us you know? so anyway we've had all kinds of different moments but um, i have to say that the first volume of this autobiography is coming hopefully next month will be out so so after, so okay, so we began working and we didn't know what to do. How do we begin? We decided to begin by transcribing the 1600 pages because otherwise we didn't know what Juan Ramon wanted to do with, with that. What, what did he want? What is, what is here? We cannot see it. <coughs> so we began doing that and it took us about two years to do it. Very slowly, you have to go slowly. And Maria Angeles told me, in this, we cannot rush. If you rush, we do it badly. If we do it badly, we will not know. So we just have to do it very slowly until we have it. After two years, we got together and I told Maria Angeles, I think I know what Juan Ramon wanted here. And she said, so do I. Because she lives in Madrid, so we, actually spend some time together every summer but during the year we communicate by email but in the summer I said I think I know and she said I think I know too <coughs> so I said why don't you write it in one piece of paper and I write it in another piece of paper and see if we coincide and yeah we did we coincided we knew <coughs> what he wanted and we had what we saw was that Juan Ramon wanted an autobiography composed of different prose works short like you saw, dealing with different themes, but also he wanted to include the best poems that he had written throughout his life, the best prose work, letters to come from him, conferences, translations. Um, he wanted to clarify difficult moments in his life for posterity and so on. So we had 17 sections that he wanted to include in the autobiography, autobiography. So, okay, now we are, we know something, right? So what do we do with that? How do we order all this material now that we have it all translated? That was a big problem. Because, um, as you know, any order has meaning. And you can emphasize something or something different. Well, what have uh, uh, other specialists done in the past? We have two sets of people. Um, one set that has finished the autobiography or, or the work for the writer. And in fact, we have an excellent edition of a book by Juan Ramon called Guerra en España that has been edited by Ante Crespo and then by Soledad González Rodena. Very well done, but what they did was they looked around, they looked in the sala, they looked everywhere for any, all the manuscripts dealing with the war, and they put it all together. And they put it together by John Rats. So that's how they decided to do it. And it's actually fascinating because, because um, <coughs> what Juan Ramon had to say is fascinating, but they did not respect what was in the files versus what was elsewhere. In a way, it assumes that they know what the poet wanted and they're going to finish it for him. On the other hand, we have those that decide they don't want to touch anything because, you know, the poet left it and uh, why should
should you touch anything let's publish it the way that it is so I, we would have published it the way I showed you one page meaning one thing the other one another thing like a collage um, it would probably uh, if we were to leave it like that and I have been reading about uh, genetic um, criticism Mark de Biasi talk about, talks about the fact that some of the specialists now leave even the marks, the in marks of the manuscripts just to leave it exact. But that only accounts for a lot of frustration on the reader's part because you would have to go through the same frustration we went through. So we didn't want to do that. So we wanted to find a middle ground here. Um, we believed that we could not finish it but we also wanted to <coughs> present it in a way that was interesting. Um, well, you might be wondering, well, if the poet died and he did not finish it, and he did not publish it, why should you? I mean, that's, that's a fair question. Who are you to do that, to go there and take those, um, those manuscripts and publish them for him? And that's a good question. Uh, but if you read the pages, he's saying he wants somebody to publish them in the pages. Somebody will publish them for him after he has died. He says that. Because I cannot, since this is my autobiography, I'll have to, in fact, we, we finished the, the first volume with, with one prose that says, if I could, I would write another page once I'm dead. <laughs> but um, so so yeah, he didn't want to, to do it himself. He wanted somebody to do it. Also, there are about two thirds of the of the book that we are going to present. It was finished mostly. Um, most of the pages are. I mean, they're understood. I don't know at what stage. Maybe uh, we call it avant text uh, before the text. But they're good enough that they can be published. And I don't know if you have been working ever on something like this, but it's, if you have been working on an author and you get a hold of manuscripts, it's very exciting because you get to see, and that's, I think, what that textual genetics does. It's really, they're not concerned so much in uh, finding or get into the actual finished text, but they're interested in the process of uh, seeing how the author is creating. And that's what you see when you look at these, these um, pages. You're seeing the poet making mistakes or uh, deleting things, adding things. You see him, um, he's not sure, you see his uncertainties. You see sometimes that he writes three words and doesn't know which one to cho choose, so he leaves, and the, he leaves the three of them. So um, it's fascinating. It's like entering into the, the workshop of the poet's mind, um, see how he's putting together all of this. And of course, um, when you do that, you don't even question, you say, of course I'm going to do it. I'm curious enough to, to, to do this. <coughs> and this book. It's going to be for people that are curious enough to, to look into it because, like I say, uh, in the title of the book, we have actually written that it's unfinished. So that nobody, we don't want, we want to present it unfinished. So, okay, so what do we do now? How, what order do we find? Um, we started looking at, looking at the index. He had written, Juan Ramon had written about over 100 indexes. And they were not dated. And they also contradicted sometimes one another. So what do we do? I'm going to show you the thing. Oh. I'll, I'll that. This is actually one of the index that we have, we have used for this project. Because um, it divides the, the autobiographical prose into the three periods that we were talking about. And he calls them juventud. Yeah, <laughs> 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 
and then he calls it Safan, Kaida. Okay. Those are the three. But I just want you to notice something else. Uh, on top here, he writes a little note to himself. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with what he's writing. He's saying to Muna that I don't want her to send me anything else. So now you want to know who Muna is, right? I mean, who is that? So then you come down here, and right here he's saying, I'm not going to answer any attacks, anyone attacking me. This gives you an idea of what you can get from just one page. Uh, so, so, and here is a poem, a little poem too, that is, and what I showed you before, in the, the one before this one, this is a menu, because he was writing be, behind the menu of the sanitarium where he was being hospitalized because he was bipolar. So here we see we get the date sometimes, and we also see what he was eating that day. It's on the other side. So you see what, I mean, this gives you an idea of all the things that you get to know about an author. I know that Roland Barthes wrote an essay in 1968, saying death of the author. Well, with genetic criticism, the author is very much alive. Mm -hmm. In fact, what we do is actually understand a lot of the things that have to do with his life, circumstances, and, and, and see the text in those in that relationship. Because now we understand why there were so many indexes. Because he says, every time I get, I feel better, I go back to my work, and I am thinking differently, so I write a different index. So you'll see uh, uh, here is a relationship between the life of the author, his circumstances, his sickness, and his um, and his his work, his community process. So we decided just to keep going. Well, let me show you a few other images. This is the one we're going to use. This is another index. Um, it says he wants to include verse and prose. And um, he says he wants to call it live and die. Um, just different options he's playing with. Um, he's saying he's going to publish about a thousand things in each of the volumes in this one. And he's got a list. And anyway, this goes on like for it took us a while. Then we realized, okay, let's do this. We're going to publish the 17 categories or sections one by one. And we're going to do with the autobiographical prose, and that's the, the first volume. But I don't know how many volumes we have to continue, uh, probably maybe three or four more. I don't know. Really. So that's where we got into. I think it's really, we have mentioned to the family that this is the work of a team, and that we would like to have at least four more people working on this. And uh, maybe we will do that, because this is just too enormous for two people. But I want to show you, um, as we wanted to, um, as we went on, we also wanted to show that the work was unfinished. So the way we tried to do that was, when possible, and if there were like two, we found several manuscripts that were of the same manuscript at different stages of composition, we're going to, we were going to show you both. To show you, to show the reader how much more works. So here is another menu. Oh, I'm sorry. Before I get there, we also found an index that is um is a three is a four-page index that he had put together, 
in this index, he has mixed to match everything. Poetry, some translations, some prose, some articles from others to him, like a collage of things. So really, I think this would be one of the forms that he would give the, the autobiography. And we were able to, to date it because here, Juan Ramón Jiménez por Federico Doniz. That is an essay that Federico Doniz wrote in 1956 when Juan Ramón won the Nobel Prize and read it at the time in Puerto Rico. So we know that this index is written just before he died. It's one of the latest index. So probably he wanted Vida to be uh, organized this way. But now he only left three and a half pages. We would have to organize it for him. Then it would be our book, our organization. Each organization, each way in which we would do this would change the um, change the book. So of course we couldn't do this. We left it. We went back to what I mentioned to, him, uh, to do things by chronological order in with the sections, which is the least. Of course, anything we do is going to be finding some kind of order, but it's the least uh, inclusive. So um, let me also, OK, so I was going to talk about how we um, showed you when something was not, to, to show you how it's not finished. OK, so here is a manuscript that he writes about Carl Wolsler. That's the first, that would be the first draft. He just writes a, um, some bullet points. This is what he does. And I'll have it transcribed here, so I'll give it to you. He said, Hotel de Lado. Mi retraimiento. My uh, isolation. He would come every day to my table and every evening to the little living room. He took my ideas about what I thought about popular, popular international universal. He came because of Hitler. I didn't go to his classes. <laughs> I told him so. He was an idiot, a traitor. His conferences in the Liceum. These are the points. Um, he w uh, in good company, Virgilio, Hay, Nietzsche, Rimbaud, Mallarmé, Darío. If this was the case, why was he coming every day to speak with me? That those are the bullet points. Now I will show you the pros that follow this. It's this one. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm not going to, in, I mean, I have it trans, transcribed here, but you can see that he has covered every one of those bullet points in the prose. The prose is not finished. He's left some parts that he needs to go back to because he needs to take um, the information from um, the lecture that Bosler gave. So we actually went through his papers, found the lecture, that Bosler gave, took what he would want to put in there, put it in there in, in that indented form for the readers to see it complete. But we alert the reader that this is something we are doing ourselves, that this is not, it wasn't there, it was not here. Same thing happens in this other one. But see, this gives you an idea, gives the reader an idea that uh, it wasn't complete. And also you get to see how he was uh, writing by presenting both both uh, Adam texts. So here's another one. This is called Disillusionment, I think it's a manual. And he starts a poem that he had written many, many years ago. And I don't know if he doesn't remember. I don't think he remembers because he missed, mixed it up here. So he leaves it blank because he's going to look at it. He's going to get it, to write it there, and then it. Well, um, this 
is how we have done it. So here is, up to here, what he has. And then we do it for him in indented form. And these little numbers that you see here, um, if we have something to say, you're going to go back to the footnotes at the end of the book. And we're going to tell you something if it needs to be told. So here um, is the poem in the form, the entire poem, and then what he wrote at the end, not indented. So that you can see the two parts that he that he had and what we had. We had it. That's the best uh, solution that we thought we could give to respect him and also to respect the reader, right? Because what does the reader want to read about that is just like that. Also, um, there are times when he writes one line. This one. This is an entry. New York, 1939. In the sadness of New York, Tomás Navarro, Tomás El Santillano, accompany me. Just put it there. Um, if the reader wants to know more about it, they can go back to the footnotes in the end, at the end of the book and we will explain what it means by that. But we also put it there because um, that's interesting why he was in New York in 1939, why he felt so lonely, why these people have to know. Mm -hmm. If you want to know, if not, it just goes on. So anyway, um, I could go on and on and on. What do we do when we found three words and none of them are deleted? Uh, which one do we use? In the past, uh, people, um, some people have used one and left, and that's it. And finish it, finish it for him, what they like the most. Other people have put the three of them. In fact, some people, and this is published by Espasa Cante, I believe, have put the three of them without, just the three of them, seguidas, um, one next to the other. It makes no sense. You, you're reading the prose and you're saying, what is the plot? Um, so what we have done is a middle ground again. We try to we the one on top because we found it was the, the last one that he added. And then the other two in the footnotes at the end of the book explaining that there are other two words not deleted that are still there. And if the reader wants to play with them, they can. But we are not going to we're going to show the prose very clean like this. Um, so what do we what did we learn through this process about Juan Ramon that was different from the image that I presented with you at the beginning? Well, uh, I was shocked by some things when I was, we were doing this. One of them is how Juan Ramon was not interested at all in fame or in being known. If he had, he would have been publishing all of this stuff because there were people asking him for that. He was not. He was not interested at all in fame or he thought that he already, the fame was ephemeral, that it would last, if you were lucky, 20 years at the most, that he had had the fame that probably was afforded to him and that now he was going to um, just live with his poems and be and, and create for his own for his own well being. We also learn how very, very connected is his life to his to his uh, poetry and how very sick he was. We didn't know this. I mean you wouldn't know this about Juan Ramon because when you see something published it's completely very well done, beautiful. You have no idea what this guy is going through. He is going through the fact that he is losing his language. He even tells us in the book that he goes to the port to talk with someone coming from Spain to hear the language so that he 
because he says that a language is a living thing and if you don't hear it, you can be using a language that is 20 years old. So he wants to hear it fresh and he <coughs> said, I can't believe I'm doing this, but he's actually driving to hear Spanish being taught when people come in the boats from, uh, from Spain at that time. Uh, what else do we find out? Well, also the fact that he had this bipolar condition and that at the time um, there was no treatment for it. So he, I think when he was hospitalized, uh, he was given vitamins. So, and I guess he had, or, or maybe electric shock. That's the way that he was working. And uh, let's see what else. So another thing that was very, very um, for me amazing and incredible is that he treated his papers as in fact, that's when he felt the best. He said he felt that he was not so alone when he was around in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. That's another reason why he didn't want to publish anything. Mm -hmm. And he has a prose in Twitter that says, when I am working surrounded by my papers, I don't want to leave. And they don't want me to leave. But if I have to leave for some reason, they get stuck to my fingers telling me, don't go. Mm -hmm. And then if I do go, um, there is like a blue glimpse in the air, like a reproach, something like that, you know, something. Um, so you get to see a man that is very much at ease with his creation and not interested at all in, in um, publishing or being famous. He was completely authentic and sincere and he refused to go back to Spain because he did not want, he did not believe in the in Franco or mm -hmm. his system and even though he needed to go for his own good, he said my principles are my principles and I will die but I will not do something that it doesn't go with my principles. Uh, he also, as I mentioned before, had a perspective, a cosmic perspective that was very interesting how he tried to see things under a different light to see himself as a little nothing and from there right. So those that think of him as this poet that is so proud of himself and so considered as not a, nothing at all of what we see here. Also, he was not afraid to say, uh, to talk about his sickness, he said. And he knew pretty much very well how they went from a mania to a depression. And he, can, he explains it very well. And he was not afraid of saying it because he says, it's not my fault. I'm trying to do the best I can with what I was given in life. So he saw something of that as destiny. Uh, he also was a man that did not believe in any religion, but he believed that there must be a God, but we humans are too small to even understand it. But for his entire life, he kept uh, interested in finding a reason for why we were here. And he thought that he could find it through symbolism. But I guess, I mean, he went as far as he could. And finally, I want to say that he was a, a man that was very faithful to his wife and very much grateful for what she had done. And when he won the Nobel Prize, he said that it was hers, that she had done it that without her, he wouldn't have had anything. And that is true. She really was the typist. She was the one, like a nurse and everything. So, um, but uh, it's, it's interesting too that in Vida we find he has not forgotten any of the women that he was with throughout his life uh, before he met Hillary. And he wants to write something for them in Vida. But he is saying, he, he left a note, but do not publish before Zenobia dies mm -hmm. because out of respect for her. So. And 
Okay, so in conclusion, what I want to say is that here is a poet that was educated in the in the Krausis tradition, which is um, ethical and aesthetics go together. The art and the ethical part go together. Life and art go together in the same way. Uh, a beautiful life, but an ethical life and an ethical type of poetry or own work. And um, so when we read the pages of Vida, we are moved by those sentiments, by the fact that he was trying so hard despite his um, feeling terrible. I mean, there are some years when he was hospitalized nine times in a year. Different, you know? So he's making a big effort and he left an immense amount of work, I mean, done. So you can see that he's trying to do whatever he can given his circumstances. So I leave it at that.
the page and say, what, what do you see here? In fact, we still do that. Uh, in fact, the family also, I think now we read better than the family. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the niece, she says sometimes, here is transcribed, and I say, no, no, that's not what it says. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <coughs> is there or are there any particular words that you never match to figure out, even though you struggle and show to other people? I guess you even ask the family on occasion? I think we don't have any words that we can figure out. Not even one. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you how you would go about tackling that, handling that. In oh my gosh, well, there were, I mean, there is a, a prose called Manicomio that took mm -hmm. us forever because there were a couple of words we couldn't figure out until we did. Mm -hmm. You know, but it took us probably seven weeks. Mm -hmm. But we just left it. We were going to put, you know, like a, a question mark. A question mark because we said that's when we don't know where, but we actually found it. Aside from the like places and stuff, are there also parts of work? And if there yeah. are, did, were you able to read what's underneath? That's a very good question because, um, yeah, you can read what's underneath, but it, we are not going to include them because they are deleted. Yeah. But there are times when he's deleting because he's saying, I've copied this already. He's not deleting it. I mean, you have to know, but he does it differently. So we, when he has copied this already, he does it in one way. When he's deleting one word and writes another one next door, um, then you know that he's just mm. chosen one. Uh, I would like to have a general question about this poetry. Uh, as you said, he was ill. He had this bipolar and depression. And so he must have had manic phrases and depressed phrases, uh, phases. Um, do you see how the poetry itself or the writing, because he wrote also prose, changes with these phases? Were you able to uh, associate certain texts with certain phases? Or I know it's a totally different work. It's not related to necessarily this manuscript. But in your experience with working with this writing, in general? Well, um, I, I have to say that Juan Ramon became very ill at the end of his life. In the early parts of his life, he was a hypochondriac. He thought, because he was very sensitive, he thought that he was going to die of a heart attack like his father had, any day, any day. So, so much so that he had to live near a doctor. And he did, all of them, all of them you know, all the time. In fact, if you go to Maryland, to Riverdale, where they bought a house, I saw, I went to see it, you know, and I looked around because I wanted to see if there was a doctor or something. Yeah, there was a clinic, <laughs> two houses down, uh, uh, to, the, to the right. So, yeah, uh, when he was in Puerto Rico, where was he living? With a doctor, in the house of the doctor. <laughs> So this is something that he had since he was 18 years old. In fact, he was hospitalized when his father died of a heart attack. And since then, he was a hypochondriac. And he said always, all his life, that he was very sick because he had a heart condition. But when he went to France to be treated for that heart condition, the family sent him to a mental place and the doctor had gout, right, gout. Yeah. Juan Ramon said he had gout. <laughs> and he was walking with a, uh, a stick, you know, a stick uh, saying that he had gout. So, and then the doctor explains in a letter to his mother, because I've read the letter saying, no, he doesn't have gout, he's just, it's like that. So, um, so mm, no, you cannot see the difference. Um, from when he's sick and when he's in, because he took very good care of that. Because for him, poetry was actually so, so important that he could not let his life take over mm. that. However, in the last part of his life, when he begins to see a big connection with poetry and his life, uh, there are some very incredible um, prose here. There is one that says Zenobia, 
in case I die. I, I, I think I know them now by heart because I've worked so much. With in case I die, there are two nurses here that just gave me an injection, and I want to tell you how my pulse is. And he writes on the, what is happening to his pulse. And the, the person to blame is Dr. Hare. He is not doing anything for me. Please watch out. They want to kill me. <laughs> so, um, he was, I mean, and, and that is, so yeah, you see it at the end of his life. But I mean, um, to what extent uh, are we really, um, should we publish this? Well, you know, Juan Ramon is dead. He's a great poet. We, I mean, those of us who know his poetry are not going to, uh, in fact, we find this to be endearing in, in many things. Um, it's interesting to see, uh, to see uh, an author that is so great in, you know, in all the different um, circumstances of his life. I don't know, for, for some of us who get very involved, um, it's fascinating. about the indexes and the ordering. Um, I was wondering if, if you have like a critical apparatus or something where you identify the other potential orderings that you mentioned in those other indexes or if you or also if you guys are editing the indexes as well. Are those a part of the project? Well we are not, not now, but um, maybe in the future we could do that to let people know and and see if any you know there are I, I, I would even attempt to do that because that would be another six years. <laughs> but um, maybe some readers, when they see the index, would want to work on that. You know, that's a project all you know in and of itself. You would have to take care of something. In fact, this would be a very good example for for a project where writing is taken as a palimpsest. You know that you are. Uh, in different layers, one yeah. above the other, and to try to figure out if you have three versions of the text, which was first, which is the, the you know, the reworked version, because sometimes it's obvious, but sometimes it may not. Actually, uh, what I think is easier, and I have, in fact, I was going to work on, the, on an article on that, are the prologues. There are 14 of them and they contradict one another. That would be much easier to see because uh, in one of them says, I'm going to write a narrative in chronological order. Obviously, that's not what he did. Mm -hmm. So, but he wrote a prologue about Vida as a narrative. Then he's got another one with all the names he was gonna give Vida. There are like 16 names, different names. He's trying different names. So that, that would be a much more, ex well, doable. Let's say that because these indexes, oh my gosh, some of them are really uh, lists of all the poems that he wants to include in me, mm -hmm. which is great because in the next volume we have the lists. So we will be using some of the index for that and the prompts. And, and you see them in several index, so it's obvious that he's very much concerned with those because it, come, it comes up over and over again. <laughs> a lot of questions and ideas. For example, nowadays with the possibilities of electronic publication, because oh yeah, the book is a book, but if there were an electronic publication, you could do something like Rayuela, you know, like, okay, this is one order of things, this is another one, this is another one, and these were all possible orders according to the court. In fact, you know what I would like to do? I would like to do this first um, order that he has. He has 350 things in the three in page index. It'd be interesting to, to actually do it mm -hmm. and, uh -huh. and see how it would look. Yeah. Just and it could be done. And, and that could be done. That's easily done. Yeah. That's another project. Could be even done in class. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, but, I mean, yeah. right now, I think. <laughs> I think this is not the, the only edition of Vida. I think after this comes out, 
um, other people will begin working with this and uh, we'll probably see much better things in the future. But we have to start somewhere. And so, but we are trying also to be very thorough because we were terrified. Uh, the community of Juan Ramoniano are, are waiting. We don't stop. Any any other questions? No. Well, thank you so much.